This is Duke University. All right, good evening, everybody. I'd like to welcome you here. Thanks for uh, spending your time with us this evening and for going watching the Duke basketball game. I mean, didn't realize oh, they're playing for the night. I mean, you scheduled this time in April, and I just realized that that was going to be a conflict just now. But uh, either way, uh, this is the uh, 2009 Duke Star Challenge Elevator Pitch Competition, and the opening event of Entrepreneurship Week this uh, this year, 2009. Uh, my name is Justin, Justin Healy. I will be your MC for the night. I am a senior public policy major and the president of the Duke Entrepreneur, and also the Duke Student Ventures Consultant for undergraduate, well, I guess undergraduate and graduate businesses, any businesses uh, operating on campus. And one thing we would also like to mention to everybody is that um, we have the new Do Hatch Business Incubator, uh, Business Hatchery in Tier this year that opened uh, late last year. And we really would like to uh, increase the number of teams utilizing some of the programs offered through DoHatch. And if you're interested in getting some mentoring, um, introductions to lawyers, potentially some VCs, you know, different things that we can offer there, uh, search for Duke Student Ventures on duke.edu. And I can set up time to meet with you and kind of get you through the process and get you um, some access to some pretty cool things through DoHatch and the Business Hatchery. Um, to give you a little bit of background on the Duke Startup Challenge, for those of you who don't know, this is the 10th annual Startup Challenge and Pitch Competition. It's one of a series of three competitions throughout the school year. Uh, the next competition will be in January sometime, and it will be the um, Executive Summary Competition. And then finally in April, we'll have the Investor Pitch and Business Plan Competition, which is kind of the culminating event in mid-April. Uh, the elevator pitch competition includes a series of three, or, or a series of semifinal events throughout the week, and this is, you know, an example of one of those events. There'll be multiple semifinals for all the different tracks. Um, Tuesday is the Energy and Environment and Healthcare and Life Sciences tracks. Wednesday is IT and Media and Women's Led Startup tracks, and Thursday is the Social Enterprise and Products and Services tracks. Um, I know some of you may be competing in some of those, so we definitely wish you luck later down the line. And we would also like to invite you to attend any of those tracks to watch other people give their pitches. It's definitely always a good educational opportunity to watch people give pitches and listen to the feedback from judges. And especially, we would like to push people attending Friday's uh, finals event who will be able to see the 14, you know, kind of top pitches on campus and hear from Bill Marist from Google. Uh, today, or I guess at every semifinal, two winners will be selected, one judge's choice and one people's choice. However, due to the uh, dramatic increase in undergraduate participation this semester, we've actually had to, on very short notice, divide this up into two smaller events. So we have another room going on next door, and I'm assuming most of you are probably aware of that. So we tonight will actually only have the judge's choice from each room going on to the finals on Friday, but there will still be a uh, audience choice at the end, so make sure you stick around for that. You'll all get an opportunity to vote. That'll be explained to you a little bit later, and there will also be the $150 prize and $100 prize given out in both rooms for the winning judge's choice and then um, people's choice candidate, uh, winning teams. Um, Tonight there will be 19 pitches, I believe, in this room, and about 20 in the other room, and we will be giving away $250 in cash prizes, and two copies of QuickBook Pro, valued at $400, for the students that win the competition. Um, I'd now like to give the judges a quick chance to introduce themselves. We will start off with Will Pearson, who is co-founder and president of Middle Class Magazine, and then move to John Fell who is a professor at the Fuqua School of Business. Excellent. Thanks. You guys hear me okay without the mic? Is that fine? Um, my name is Will Pearson. I <coughs> graduated in 2001 as a history major here. Uh, in spring of 2000, another Duke student, Mangesh Antikater, and I uh, had an idea for a magazine. Uh, and we 
decided to call it mental floss. The idea was very simple. You know, here we were at a great college, learning so many interesting things, realizing we were about to go beyond the world of Duke, uh, but wanted to continue learning. But we also recognized one other thing, and that was the fact that most textbooks that we had been asked to read through the course of our high school and, and college education weren't the most interesting reading that we'd ever picked up or the most entertaining reading that we'd ever picked up. And so we decided to try to come up with a publication that could blur the lines between education and entertainment to help people learn, but also get people a laugh and let them uh, enjoy the process at the same time. So after distributing copies here in our junior year and then in our senior year, we launched the magazine uh, Beyond Duke uh, in the summer of 2001. Um, eight years later, we're still going at it, it's still going strong, it's going very well for us. Uh, we have about a quarter of a million regular readers to, uh, of the magazine. Uh, we publish 10 books, a number of games, uh, uh, a board game, and, and so, among other things, and uh, are still having a blast doing it. So uh, I'm thrilled to see the growth of entrepreneurship uh, here at Duke and, and the resources that are available to you guys, and I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, in a minute, but that's, uh, that's my background. Thank you, Will. Um, I'll, although I have a much longer career than Will's, I will try to be briefer. <laughs> um, the 90 up on beside my name represents uh, sort of the middle of, of my uh, working life. My first real job was teaching philosophy at uh, Duke, um, which I did from 1977 to 82. I was a philosophy and math major. I'd never heard of entrepreneurship. Um, I left, I also have a graduate degree in uh, computer science, left to work for IBM for a while, and they graciously paid for an MBA. And even by 1990, I don't think I'd ever heard of entrepreneurship. Um, since then, I was um, in, uh, after I left IBM, I was in three um, venture-backed startups. I was the CEO of a couple of them, and uh, VP of engineering of one. And, um, I invested, I've invested in about half a dozen businesses very early, and some of them have made me money, and some of them lost me all my money, and I've been an advisor to a number of startups <coughs> over the years. Uh, so, uh, and I'm now back um, at Duke, now teaching something I'd never heard of until my career was at Boulder, called uh, entrepreneurship. And I hope, um, I, I, I hope you all are starting to get wind of uh, some of the opportunities for um, uh, being involved in some of the entrepreneurship programs that are sort of coming out of Fuqua, but hopefully with uh, opportunities for undergrads and engineering students, engineering students and everybody else. Um, the one thing that uh, I will say is, I know we have an opportunity to ask you questions. Many of your pitches will have the form of, I invented a really neat thing. And I will ask you, um, have you found anybody who has a problem you can solve with the thing you've invented? So, um, and, and this is uh, sort of the hallmark of our program, which is to try to orient you to the problem you're solving, not so much to the invention that you created. And so we'll talk a little about that. The other thing I'd, I'd say, and, and Will reminded me of this, is that um, we are not any smarter than any of you. So if you don't win, it doesn't mean that you don't have the best idea. It's just that we weren't smart enough to figure it out. So do not be discouraged if you don't win. And also, I hate this, you know, somebody has to be the winner uh, mentality anyway. Um, and keep in mind that a two-minute pitch is a really, really minuscule part of creating a venture and starting a venture and launching a venture. It's not unimportant, but try to keep this exercise in perspective. It's fun, but uh, there are a couple of other things you have to do over the time to master a two-minute pitch. But uh, I've done this now for, I don't know, four years, and I, I always ask to be um, put into the undergraduate track because it is absolutely the most fun, so I'm looking forward to hearing what you have to say. All right, thank you very much. Uh, before moving on, I'd really like to thank our sponsors real quick, starting with um, InterSouth Partners, a leading venture capital firm, Hughes, Pittman, and Gupton, an accounting firm for startups, Hutchison Law Group, a law firm for startups, Eye Contact, email marketing software, Square One Bank, a venture, cap uh, venture bank for startups, Wyrick Robbins, a law firm for startups, Intuit, creators of QuickBook Pro, and Palo Alto Software, creators of the Business Plan Pro. Uh, now I'd like to hand the microphone back over to Mr. Pearson from Mental Floss to speak for a few minutes about his experiences in the Startup Challenge in the past, 
and to give you guys a few words of wisdom before we do the presentations. Uh, it will probably say up here 15 minute talk, maybe not. If so, just ignore that because I know we're looking forward to getting on to hearing what you guys have to pitch. I just wanted to spend a couple of minutes and um, remind you of a couple of things. One, as John pointed out, I, I did want to emphasize that don't walk out of here either having won or lost thinking that that's the end or we're, we're suggesting that if you didn't win that you should move on because I should mention, uh, as was mentioned before, that this contest is about 10 years old and uh, Mangesh and I, when we created Mental Floss, we actually entered the Duke Startup Challenge and lost and didn't even get to the semifinals. So it means very little. Um, and so, you know, obviously try to take some of the advice from here, but don't, don't, don't put too much weight into it. Um, I wanted to give you just three quick pieces of advice um, in, in all of this. One, the fact that you were undergraduates here um, at Duke is a huge advantage for you. Take advantage of the resources that are here. One of the first things that we ever did before putting words on paper or design on, you know, on a screen or doing anything else was to recruit an advisory board of uh, Duke alumni when we realized we wanted to start a magazine. And so we started digging through the resources that they had um, for Duke students and trying to find alum out there that had been successful in the field that we were looking into. And I can assure you, whatever field you're looking to go into, even if you have a new and innovative idea, there are those that are out there that could be very helpful to you. And that um, advisory board has been um, hugely helpful to us from the very beginning over the course of the past eight years. So I would recommend that, as well as all the resources that are here on campus, which are you know, probably 10 times what they were even eight years ago when we were uh, when we were leaving Duke. The fact that entrepreneurship really has some momentum going here at Duke is a huge advantage for you guys. So please do take advantage of that and, and look to talk to as many people in those fields as you can. The second point kind of building on that is, again, to talk to as many people as you possibly can in refining your idea. I know that you want to be protective of what you're doing. But just to give you one example of, of what I mean by this, when we first graduated from Duke and knew that we were taking this publication beyond Duke, um, we had the opportunity to meet with a few people in, in New York right after we were starting. And one of those people uh, was the CEO of Time Inc., the largest publishing company in the world. And so we thought this is going to be a huge conversation for us. Had the opportunity to present the idea to him. Really nice guy, really good conversation. Gave some good advice but nothing really game-changing for us. And so we were a little bit bummed by that. That night we went to stay with a friend uh, in New York and, and uh, you know, he was transitioning on to a job and we actually had dinner with his, his mother that night. And she had been a stay-at-home mom for, uh, for most of her life. And so but we, we were telling her about the idea of mental floss and told her, you know, Here, here's an idea for a company that wants to blur the lines between education and entertainment. Um, and to help people feel smarter, but doing so in a way that, that makes them enjoy the process. About a week later, we got a call from her. She said, you know, I've been thinking about this, and uh, one of my in-laws works for HarperCollins, one, one of the biggest publishing companies in the world. Turns out not only did she work for them, she was the CEO of the company. And <laughs> 10 books later, you know, we still have our friend John's mother to thank for this introduction. So I'm honestly not kidding when I say there are two reasons, two probably more, two great reasons to have this conversation with as many people as you possibly can. One, you never know what that conversation might turn up, and two, it continues to help you refine your pitch. Because while I do completely agree that two minutes isn't everything, it is critical that you refine that pitch to be able to say to somebody very quickly, here's what my business is all about. Because if you can't do it in a couple of minutes, it, it starts to get a little foggy as to what that real idea actually is. And then the third thing, kind of building on what I said before and trusting your gut and the fact that, you know, um, we, you, know you, you do need to believe in what you're doing and not just listen to the, the naysayers that are out there. Just to illustrate this with one example, uh, when we first uh, came up with the idea for Mental Floss to distribute on campus, we had the opportunity to meet with the president of the university. It was before President Broadhead. And, uh, her name was Nan Cohan, and we sat down with her and explained the idea for Mental Floss. And she loved the idea, but she hated the name, Mental Floss. And she said, you know, I really want you to consider calling this magazine Conversations. And we thought about it, 
and we cried about it, and it was, you know, an awful experience. And here we were in the presence of somebody ten times smarter than we could ever dream of being, but didn't quite get what we were trying to do. And so, as John pointed out earlier, just because you know you may get the feedback that if you weren't our favorite idea tonight means very little. It's just an opportunity to try to practice your pitch and to maybe take some comments from here as, as you refine it. So uh, those are the main things I wanted to, uh, to share with you guys. Congratulations on getting to this point. I mean, this is, this is a hurdle for most people that have ideas for, for businesses is really not saying, okay, I'm going to take that next step to actually put together a plan and pitch this. It takes a lot of guts to do this, so I want to congratulate you on this. I uh, want to share just how excited I am that so much is going on with entrepreneurship here at Duke uh, and wish you guys the best of luck tonight. So. All right. Uh, thank you much, Mr. Thank you very much, Mr. Pearson, for those words of wisdom. And if you guys haven't read Mental Floss Magazine, I suggest picking up a copy. It's actually pretty good. I really like it. I'm a subscriber. Have been for three years, so. Um, I would now like to pass the mic off to Daniel Weinstein, who will be running the event for the rest of the day, and I'm going to move on to timing everyone. So. Yes. Hi everybody, it's time for the competition. My name is Dan Weinstein, I'm a second year MBA student over at FIPA. I helped organize the, this week's events and I'll be <coughs> facilitating uh, tonight. So before we get started, I'm going to go over the mechanics of how the night will work. I will be sitting right there. I will call the next team's name up. Uh, please stand up there and give your pitch. Uh, two minutes pitch will be timed. Um, then there will be three minutes of Q&A from the judges only. Um, that's also timed. Don't be able to stop with us. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and then I'll announce the next teams. We'll be doing it in the order that's in your program. Um, so that's how it works for the pitchers. For the audience, you guys play a couple key roles. First is um, providing feedback to the pitchers. So all you guys should have a four minutes like this that are sitting in the chairs all around. Um, so we're, we asked you guys to fill out one of these for everybody who pitches tonight. Um, during the Q&A from the judges, it's probably a good time to do it. Uh, the feedback's really helpful for the participants to help them get better at pitching and work on their plan. Everybody got their, their sheets? Alright, um, so Tonight, we're going to pick two teams to advance to the finals, one from each room. Uh, the, the, the team that will advance will be picked by the judge. And the way it works is an elevator pitch, an elevator pitch is meant to be kind of a quick, a quick summary of your idea in order to entice an investor to want to meet with you again. So that's how they'll be uh, your, your, That's how they'll be uh, doing their, their uh, judging. Um, we'll also do an audience participation at the end. Um, so the judge's choice will advance to the finals and we'll get $150. The audience choice won't advance, but we'll get $100. Um, so at the end of the night, you guys will have a chance to vote via text message for your favorite pitch. So timing. So in addition to being judges and giving feedback as the audience, you will play a key role in helping with timing. So Justin will have a stopwatch. And he will, uh, when it hits two minutes, he will advance the slide to this. <laughs> At which point, everyone in the audience will yell. Stop. Uh, all right. Let's do a practice round. Are right, you ready? Uh, 20 seconds. Oh, sorry. He'll also give you a, he'll wave his hand when there's 20 seconds left. So let's do a, a practice. Are you ready to click here? Uh, we have, I'll just talk to you. Are you ready to take the stop? Yeah. All right. All right. So I'm I'm Joe Pitcher. I've got this idea for kitten mittens. And, <laughs> all right. So I've got my 20 seconds. And please invest in me. It'll change your life. Stop. Stop. All right. <laughs> Amazing. Good work. So any questions? Is it all clear? All right. So let's let's get started. 
Um, is Firewire's team here? I didn't think so. Uh, I know it, when it, you guys are here? All right, you're starting it off. Good evening, everyone. My name is Sam Rod Ray, and I'm a Duke senior passionate about math and science education in the US. Now, I'm convinced that math and science skills are the cornerstone of our country's greatness and competitiveness, but it's no secret that we're falling behind. This is where my idea for the website Know It, Win It comes in. Now, remember when you were kids working on elementary school fundraising campaigns, where you spent hours and hours working on those campaigns just so you could get that shiny toy in the fundraiser booklet? Or maybe you worked on accelerated reader campaigns and spent hours and hours reading books just so you could get points and trinkets from your teacher. Now, what if we use that same potential with the large scale of the internet to reward kids for honing their math and science skills? Here's how Know It When It works. If you're a kid, open up an account for free on Know It When It and start answering math and science questions and start accumulating points for getting right answers to these math and science questions. Now, as you win more and more points for more and more difficult questions, you can then redeem those points for gifts and services from corporate sponsors. Now, you might be asking, how does the business model work? It's actually quite simple. As a corporate sponsor, you provide the rewards and services to the kids, as well as payment to knowitwinit.com. In return, you receive a large access to the youth market, positive PR for investing in education, as well as the development of early brand loyalty, which is incredibly invaluable. This, in a nutshell, is Know It Win It. Thank you. First of all, great energy. Um, I, I really liked how you you know you define the problem, you set it up before you got into the here's what it is part of the explanation. Quick question for you: Can you tell me one more time about the the revenue stream? Were you saying that it was primarily on the advertising side, or there's a subscription piece to it for the for the right. players as well? Right. Just to clarify, so it's free access. But there's uh, supposed to be large scale seamless embedded advertising, uh -huh. um, as well as, I guess, payment to know it when it. Okay. Um, for the success. Payment to know it when it's being from the advertising. Right, so the corporate sponsors provide rewards and services as well as payment, and in return they receive for large scale advertising. Okay. Have you worried about um, this undermining the uh, incentive to learn for its own sake, and, and does it have a way to? Driving children to learn, and do they ever transition to um, sort of the value of learning and knowing for some sort? Right, that's a great question. I think it's an exciting supplement. So what it does is get kids energized about learning, and that then carry them on in the long term. So if you look at like the Pizza Hut <coughs> reading awards program, I mean, as a kid, that really excited me about rewards, just so I could get you know pizza box. But eventually, that sort of translated into loving books for books. So I'm, I'm hoping that this will be a transition, but also, you know, as a supplement to allow students to own another math and science skills. Have you looked at any of the other um, sites that are out there, Club Penguin? Um, I mean, don't ask me why I know so much about kids' education sites. Um, <laughs> Club Penguin and a few others that are actually charging a small subscription fee. Um, the cog especially with, with the climate right now as it is in the advertising market, really struggling, and especially even, even online. Mm -hmm. um, is that something you've considered <coughs> while charging a small subscription fee for, for this product, for this service? I have not. That's a great idea. But the reason for the comparative advantage of keeping it free was to allow the kids to get those rewards. Um, as well as, in terms of advertisement, I'm envisioning something like Pandora.com, where you kind of have a seamless embed advertisement, which is doing pretty well for Pandora. Yeah. Um, so that's something that I'm looking at, but that's definitely great. Yeah, I'd recommend looking at a couple of those sites just, just to learn more about mm -hmm. them, to see what they're doing. I don't know a whole lot about how well they're working, but Club Penguin and there's one of them that's escaping me really, really took off. So mm -hmm. um, it's probably something worth looking at. Especially now, again, just to um, bring that up again, you know, online advertising has, has taken a beating in the last couple of years. It doesn't mean that it's not there. It's something that's right. Great job, great presentation. Thank you. Thank you. All right, up next is Carbone.
few months ago, I, like any other 20-year-old, was reading The Economist and worrying about osteoporosis. Uh, it happened to be the technological issue of The Economist where they featured an oxygen battery that was like set to sweep the lithium-ion battery market in the next five years. I was incredibly intrigued by the oxygen battery because it has a porous carbon electrode that swaps all of the horrible lithium and reduces the size of the battery to one-tenth of its normal size. So I was like, why didn't I think of the battery? And then I worried about osteoporosis some more. And then the next day, I came up with an idea to recycle waste bone, I was thinking about osteoporosis, and turn it into these carbon electrodes. So I thought it was a crazy idea. And then I took it to a team of chemists who are now on our team, a graduate chemist and a graduate electrochemist in the engineering school. And we've developed a process that recycles waste bone from slaughterhouses and turns it into the porous carbon electrodes that would not only go in the oxygen batteries that will soon replace lithium ion batteries, but will also be used in like other modern electronics like supercapacitors and huge batteries that would go into electric cars. So we foresee like developing this research, developing this model and this product uh, through more extensive research and development and soon setting stage for introduction to the oxygen battery market sometime in the next, say, five years. Okay. Uh, not much. It was just the little spark that got me to think about it. It was honestly just a huge leap to go from osteoporosis. Um, it mainly had to do with the mesopore structure of the bone. Bones have meso and mesopore structures. The mesopore structures are at the nanotube level. That's roughly the exact size that's necessary for these for these carbon electrodes to work. So it's not uncommon in industry to swap to use like a natural structure. Um, that's porous and swap it for some other chemical, like a, a natural, art, like a, I'm sorry, an artificial petrification process. So what are you using? What are you harvest the bone? What, so I had this idea that you just wanted, you know, basically harvest the carbon material. You're actually trying uh, to get the structure from... Uh, no, we definitely steal the structure. So bones, like certain sections of bones, say <coughs> the femur, the middle of the femur has a huge amount of carbon, but it also has phosphates in it. Now normally you would, a slaughterhouse would take the bone and sell the phosphate to say the fertilizer market and they would just throw away the carbon. Well, what we were able to do is bake that bone inside of, like, inside of a vacuum with some sort of catalyst like magnesium and zinc and we're currently researching the ones that work best and that actually steals the pore structure of the bone, keeps the nanostructures of the carbon that are necessary for the electrode to work and washes the porous, like, uh, washes the phosphates away and we can sell that phosphate into the into the fertilizer markets as well. Just, what, what's the collagen involved? Then? What, what, what is that? Is that the part of the carbon? Or is that part of the phosphate structure? Or it's part of the phosphate structure for the so, most part. So, could you harvest co uh, collagen at the other side? Yeah. You get both. Uh, we would. Our process does the carbon the carbon base carbonization first, and then moves the the phosphates out. Have you, have you been with the science? <laughs> have you been baking bones in your apartment? No. <laughs> My mom was a cook. My mom's a potter. But I haven't baked a bone in that yet. Yeah, yeah. Um, Tell me what, what uh, industry you see this entering first. I know you said something about automobiles, but where do you see a step one this would go? Which industry? Step one, I see small electronics. Uh, okay. Small electronics are what stand to, to uh, benefit most from the oxygen battery. Okay. And the oxygen batteries are set to be introduced three to five years from now. Okay. So we have three to five years to get these contracts laid out and, and get uh, access to the porous carbon manufacturers um, okay. and throw it in there. And you, can you talk a little bit more about the problem, kind of as John alluded to before, what, what is the problem that you're now solving? I know you touched on that a little bit. Right, absolutely. The problem specifically in relation to us, we're not trying to make these batteries. The problem is that the construction of the porous carbon electrodes themselves is expensive because it's artificial. It involves like taking a carbonous material and shooting lasers through it to like nano tunnel, effectively. So what we've developed is a cheap green way to recycle bones, stealing the structure to get the same type of carbon electrode. Okay, so this is saving the company's money. This will save the company's and money. Saving the environment. This is an, an incredibly environmentally sound. So if cap and trade okay. steps in, they get a huge carbon <coughs> footprint reduction. Yeah. Just two quick suggestions. One, make sure to include the environmental piece because businesses are always looking for that as part of being able to promote that. And two. Uh, and two, uh, the other point I was going to make was that uh, make sure you define <coughs> that problem, problem clearly and when you're giving that pitch. I would recommend that. And then number three, if this is real property, intellectual property, right? Yeah, we're, we're yeah, working on intellectual property right now, too. Yeah. Okay.
great job once again. Thanks, good presentation. Good presentation. Good presentation. Next is eFit Health Solutions. Hi, my name is Cliff Sattel, and I'm here to tell you about the future of fitness. We all know that we have a healthcare crisis in America. A full two-thirds of American adults are overweight, and for the first time ever, a majority of kids are too. Instead of doing what Congress is doing and helping people once they already get sick with insurance reform, we want to help people before they ever get sick by keeping them healthy. So why are Americans so unhealthy? Because they don't have the time to work out, they don't have the motivation to take that first step, but most important, there's just too much information in there. Online you can find a million fad diets and workout plans are a dime a dozen. But here's the problem, none of those plans are tailored to fit your needs, your life, and your body. That's where eFit Health Solution comes in. By working with clients on a personal level, We'll customize plans that will work for them, whether they're a busy college student or a busy professional. Through mostly web-based interactions, we will customize a plan that will offer our clients healthy eating options and work to find an exercise plan that fits into their life, not the other way around. The industry is already huge, but nobody has taken the model online and offered people the type of personalized service we will. Americans already spend $46 billion a year on weight loss, but 97% of those consumers get at least some of it right back. And Americans spend uh, $12 billion on gym memberships a year, but 80% of those people don't use their memberships because they either don't know how to use gym equipment or they can't afford a personal training. That's where eFit Health Solutions comes in. We will make money through mo monthly membership dues, as well as a pay-per-goal program where people can come to us for specific goals like weddings, uh, holidays, or just to get healthy. We will make money through targeted online advertising, and there's lots of opportunity for expansion into retail for nutritional supplements and equipment uh, retail. The team right now is small. In addition to myself, I'm working with two personal trainers in Philadelphia with over 20 years of experience. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. Good job. Another great presenter. So, uh, what? Tell me, you were talking about membership dues. Where? What would you think you'd be setting the price at for those membership dues? Or give us an idea if it's tiered. Give us something. Like I'll give you the honest answer. I haven't gotten that far. Okay. But the way I envision it, I envision two models. One, people who, on a sort of indefinite basis, um, would like help like personal trainers do, or if people have specific goals, say beach season is coming, or they have a wedding they want to get in shape for, or they just need to get healthy with the doctor told them. Right. So within those two tracks, um, I haven't developed any specific numbers, but that's how I envision it. And you talked a little bit about, uh, or I see on the slide here, gym partnerships. Is that right. to get the word out? Is that to yes. reach your target audience? Primarily, I want this to be an online business because it is easier for the consumer. But naturally, people want to work at a gym, so I think if you partner with gyms who are uh, on board with our programs and can help people in person while we help people from a little bit further away, I think that could be a very uh, valuable partnership. You might be able to even use that in pitching the gyms to say, you know, as you guys know, there's an attrition right here. People join, they don't come for a year, then they quit. We're helping you by keeping the people coming to the gym and staying members. So just something to think about. I mean, because you can't squeeze everything in two minutes, but it's just for you, something to think about. But I would encourage you to think a little more about the membership dues when you're presenting this. You want to make sure that the person who's listening to you knows that you've kind of got a rough revenue model worked out for them. So nice, nice job as well. I want to talk about your top left-hand block. You have, it, it seems to be a thesis that America is out of shape and um, is it 66? percent of adults are overweight, yes. and are the four things below that the reasons why 66% um, of adults are overweight, or is it they, um, they, do they, are they combined, are they, you're overweight for one of these four reasons, are these four of a hundred reasons, and, and how did you pick those four? Well, I, I looked at it from not what caused the problem, but more how we can fix the problem, so I suppose the way to look at those four things is why aren't people getting healthy? Not necessarily why are they obese. Okay, so so those are four reasons why people are not getting healthy. Is that what you mean? 
How did you, so where did those four come from? They've come from my experience actually working with Duke students. Uh, people have come to me and they're people, they're kids who are not in shape, but they want to get in shape, but they just don't know where to start. They're really overwhelmed by the amount of information coming at them. So there are several friends of mine that, where I got the idea for this, where I've gone to the gym with them, walked them through programs, and I've listened to what they've had to say. <coughs> it's funny, I come from a generation where people were out of shape because there was too little information, particularly with the lack of motivation. <laughs> so that's why I'm, I may be a little more skeptical on, on an information-based solution to a problem that's been with us for uh, longer than the information has. Let me say it one other way. Think of how many diets are out there. There's the Atkins diet, the South Beach diet, and uh, literally a million other books out there. And some work for some people, but some don't work for other people. They're built for the masses, not for the individual. So overwhelming, yeah. And there's no question that this is a, a huge market. You know, I mean, whether you can tap into it, I guess, is, is the question. But yeah. great job. Guys. Thank you. Thank you. Should be at the top of the list of solutions to the world's energy problems. Why? Well, before we start increasing our power production, we should be able to efficiently use the energy we have now. Just common sense. Think of the example. Over 10% of energy used in residential homes is wasted on standby power consumption. This translates into $12 billion a month of wasted energy, or up to $150 billion a year of wasted energy. Now, the technology exists to combat this, and it's very, very effective. However, Items like smart power strips or remote smart meters are impractical. Who wants to go around in their home or office and switch off every power strip to every appliance? Now the potential savings is massive. Now, Aurora Networks has a solution to energy waste that does not require a energy <coughs> consumer behavior. It's a combination of wireless thermostats, switches, and smart outlets, comprised of a Zigbee wireless transmitter, uh, a switch, and a meter. The system acts as an automated power regulation network. It can be accessed online from anywhere, and for, uh, for consumers, it offers simplicity and performance, while the online display showcases past, real-time, and forecasted energy consumption and savings. Each component of the Aurora network has a payback period of less than two years, and using the Aurora network, we can reduce power consumption by upwards of 30%, reaping massive benefits to companies and homes and we can take a massive cut of the $30 billion energy conservation market. Now our average system is roughly $350. We believe we can reach $250 million in market cap, or excuse me, in revenue over a five year period, based on a roughly 15% market penetration rate. From the president to the UN to the world, the problem of energy efficiency has become an issue of the highest priority, clear from the actions of the president in his 2012 uh, Green Energy Bill. Aurora Networks is perfectly poised to capitalize and provide an answer to energy efficiency and optimization while realizing extensive profits. Um. <laughs> Once again, no question that this is something on the minds of many people. So you're saying that if I purchase this as a consumer, mm -hmm. that this would tap into, say, you know, the TV that you don't want to unplug every night but is wasting energy, and the thermostat, and the toaster oven, and the... So what we're saying, we, we can actually go one step further. So there are a lot of, you know, you can set your coffee timer so it goes on every morning and right. cuts your coffee. But we can actually aggregate the data so we know if, say, your TV is on, you want your DVD player on, your Xbox on, all that stuff. But if your TV is off, there's no use for that to be on at all. Right. And then beyond that, we can uh, access it over the internet. So say you have a refrigerator you don't want on your summer home, until two days before you get there, so it's cold. So you can actually turn that on through the network, so it would be cold by the time you get there, and you can put your cream cheese and your eggs and stuff in there by the time you get there. Okay. Um, will it put the cream cheese in? No. <laughs> Close. Well, you know, I would suggest, as far as you did define the problem, I would suggest that actually you defined the global problem before you defined the individual's problem. Mm -hmm. And I would probably suggest almost reversing that as part of the bigger thing or getting to it more quickly because once you got to that, it clicked for me. Like, I get it. I get why the consumer wants it. I get why the business wants it. We all know that there are energy, there's energy waste and energy problems, but I, I would, just one suggestion, I would suggest kind of getting to that part yeah, that a little more quickly. Okay, let me just pick up on that. The way to think about this is the problem 
should be felt by, the, or the need should be felt by the person that you want to make the decision. The decision you want to influence will be an individual consumer's decision. How are you going to influence that decision and what's meaningful? And, and so to take that one step further, so I'm a target customer for you. I care, but what obstacles do you see to my adopting the solution? There's, there's definitely a hurdle you have to reach in, in taking Describe the pledge. Describe that hurdle very quickly. So what we're doing is we're doing kind of a two-prong approach. So there's a retrofit option and there's the contractor option. Right. So the, the retrofit is basically a, a plug you put on your, your, your walls. You can put up your thermostat, you can put up your power outlet. But we want to get in on the base level, so actually have the contractors do this. So a lot of green, even city projects, going in Dubai, California, we think that'd be very interesting for us to get in on the proposed base level there and uh, make it network through the whole organization. You can't be the only person who's had an idea like this. In, in, has of we're not. There, there are there are products such as like Kilowatt, which um, tells you how much power you're, you're using and right. how you use it's better. And um, there's actually a, a company similar to this in this competition. But um, we feel that our system is a bit more comprehensive and it's a lot more user friendly and we have a lot, we, um, we think we can do a lot more in predicting when things should be used. So televisions, refrigerators, stuff like that. So basically we think we're smarter. And help us bring up the smarter house to according to things. Nice job. Good job. Thank you. So, as I'm sure everyone knows, that final week is the most stressful time for any undergraduate student, especially at Duke University. However, at the same exact time, students are pulling off all nighters in the digital monster. Um, they also have to redirect part of their effort into performing chores related to summer storage. So, currently, um, some Duke students use a outside door-to-door -door pickup and delivery service. But although it's really convenient, they charge a very exuberant amount of money for it. Other students use stealth storage to mitigate their costs by splitting a storage unit with several friends. But the trade-off <coughs> is that although it's really cheap, at the same time they spend a lot of money that they could devote to studying to moving their stuff back and forth. Duke Boston seeks to combine the affordability of stealth storage with the convenience of door-to-door -door pickup and delivery into one efficient solution for summer storage at Duke University. The way we accomplish that is that we are going to contract with a local storage facility to guarantee a set storage space at a set price. So our current market consists of the 4,300 undergraduate students who are not from North Carolina and are not seniors. Um, with a very conservative 10% market penetration, we estimate profits to be $4,000 for this first year. However, we expect to grow rapidly through word of mouth and will increase profits to up to $15,000. And this is profit, not revenue. Um, we want to expand our model, if it's successful at Duke, to other universities and plan to get a portion of the profits from each of the universities that we expand to. We are looking for $700 to cover the initial <coughs> cost of storage and labor. And that's it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Help me understand again how you're saying you guys are going to own the space where... No, we are going to contract with a local storage facility. And how is that going to be different than, say, them going to a storage place. You're, you're saying because you're going ahead and renting a certain larger... We're also providing the service of pickup and delivery. Okay. So everything's included in our cost. Okay. The storage space, as well as pickup and delivery from and to your dorm. Okay. Are you doing this now? Yes. We actually met with the contractor today. And, and so you're providing the service for the students for this spring, you're not... Hopefully this spring, yes. Um, do you expect people to sign contracts with you? Uh, you know, do, do, what level of commitment are you going to get before you uh, go contract for the space and why all the proper boxes are not the truck? Well, um, are you talking about this contrast with students? I mean, or are you, so 
this is a, an exercise in capacity planning. Right. So how would you decide the capacity that you need to serve your customers in May of 2010? Right, well, of course it's a, it's a break even point um, where we need a certain amount of students to come into the service, which we will utilize through a kind of website and offer a discount for pre-sale to kind of incentivize students to register beforehand. And that will be a commitment to the penalty for backing out or something like that? Or yes, I mean. Or prepay something. Exactly. Yeah. I think that's a good idea to do the commitment. How many, how many of you would sign up? Just do a simple market survey. If we charge $50 for our entire service, for all your stuff for the entire summer, including dorm, delivery, and storage. Now, how many of you would sign up? Just $50. <laughs> I don't even have stuff here. <laughs> can, I, can I ask a question? I don't know. You asked the uh, guys running the place. Is this, is this a customer uh, kind of question? No. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Keep quiet. <laughs> so what, what could possibly prevent this from being successful in college? What could prevent this from being successful? I mean, what risks are there in this? Well, there is obviously insurance risk, which um, anyone who does self storage does take on that risk. Most self storage places don't have insurance. So us taking their stuff for them to the insurance, um, to the storage place is not really a, a risk that we incur from um, self storage to um, our service. But a risk that we have is insurance and moving the stuff from the door to the storage place. And can you buy an insurance policy? Uh, we're working on an insurance policy right now. And, and you think at $50 a person, this can generate what you project? Yes. Good job. Yeah. 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 Good evening, everyone. My name is Ben Hammer. I'm a senior here at Pratt. Now I'm going to talk to you about something, first of all, I find amazing, and two limitations of this that are prevented from reaching its full potential and then how I'm going to help it reach its full potential. First of all, this phone right here has a 600 megahertz processor in it about 256 megs of RAM. This means it's more powerful than the computer I used back in high school. However, why can I use it as a full computer? There's two limitations to it. First of all, it has a smaller screen. There's another company, Microvision, that's working to allow a well, to project on a wall or any other object anywhere, you have a screen problem. Now that leaves a second huge limitation. Now, as each of you who's tried to use the credit keyboards on these phones know, to type out an email or text message, it is a pain to use. It takes a really long time to actually do anything efficiently, other than talk on a phone with a phone. So to deal with this problem, I what I'm trying to do is develop technology to use surface electromyography signals, which are electrical signals seen on the skin from muscular contractions to detect what key a person is pressing on a keyboard via two wristbands so a person can type without a keyboard and then add two accelerometers to each of these wristbands to give mouse control as well. This will enable a person to have full control of a phone as if it was a computer without a keyboard or a mouse or any other appliance and able to them to truly do mobile computing on the go, anywhere they go. Then this is an idea in its very initial stage, as I conceived of about three weeks ago. So I, all right now I'm looking for engineering expertise and signal processing expertise and marketing expertise to help design the user experience that will really make this seamless to use. Thank you. Great, thank you. Electrical engineering and biomedical engineering. So, okay. kind of at the intersection of the challenges that okay. this project faces. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I'm sure I'm slow. I don't get how what the, what the uh, sort of use model is for this technology. If I have these two wristbands, what am I going to do? Am I going to pretend to type out on a flat space, or am I going to have a piece of paper that's cool? I mean, how am I going to do the things that will transmit the signals to the wristband? Do you look at a keyboard when you type normally? Well, I 
so I, it's be very difficult for me to answer that without embarrassing myself. <laughs> <laughs> okay. not, not always. So there's two different usage models that I'm looking at depending on the level of signal quality. And yet if it's a very high fidelity signal, <coughs> it's actually, if a, like a piece of paper, someone needs assistance, but sit there and type on a piece of paper. If not, then just type on any surface, a desktop or something. And but, so you know that, that if, if, if I took some unsuspecting uh, victim from the audience and put him in front of a, a flat um, table, that they could consistently type without any feedback or without or minimal feedback in a way that would be, um, uh, that your system would capture and that you wouldn't drift to the right, drift up, or, I mean, you'd have to calibrate and then you'd have to keep somebody within the bound, right? The heat of this is it's not monitoring from a video, it's monitoring from the electrical signal. So these signals are fairly consistent, actually, based on it, that finger movement matters and finger position, not a position of the hands or any other features along those lines. So if necessary, I could provide a piece of paper that could... No, but that would help. That, 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 I mean, you need, the, you need the same movement to translate to the same, um, the, the, the same uh, key. That's what you need. What do you need to have? Effectively, yes, but that's also a, there. There will be a learning curve associated with this on the level of the user. The idea from the user experience model is to make that learning curve as slow as possible. But the user would have to have a consistent action for pressing, say, the P key as opposed to the P key right beside it. Who do you see being the primary target for this? Anyone who needs to type a document up or respond to an email on the go. Also, it has that added benefit that would help transfer radio amputees to type. Uh, I just love the idea of going into an airport at some time in the future and most people just sitting around. And cost wise, I guess you said you thought about this three weeks ago, so you really, I guess, haven't gotten into the whole cost model of this and what it might cost to produce versus what you'd sell it for? Is that something you thought about at all? <coughs> I can go through a quick breakdown of that. Bluetooth chips themselves are maybe 3 to $10 depending on what's needed out of it. There are made to be a blue chip chip with each device. The electrics themselves are an expensive in the order of <coughs> Since the battery technology would be able probably five or six dollars to use really small rechargeable batteries that are capable of powering this device. That would be another challenge that this faces. So relatively inexpensive. Yeah, so on the order of twenty to thirty dollars as a manufactured product. So what's your confidence that this will actually work? That is that that you can capture consistently the signal that you need. That's what I'm exploring right now with this. Um, I do have confidence that I could use a new system of typing, saying moving to my two pinkies to signify the letter A and so on. I've successfully, basically with 100% detection, right, figure out which finger is moving. Now I'm moving on to figure out how precise I can determine the finger position. So that brings that into play inside the usage model I talked about. Signal. So but thank you very much. Excellent job. Thank you. <laughs> okay, your unit cautiously patrols down a quiet alleyway in some unnamed Central Asian uh, city. Um, suddenly you spot a gunman on the second story of a, of a, of a balcony, about two, uh, 200 meters in front of you at 12 o'clock. What do you do next? Well, you probably glance down at the 15 button controller that you're holding in your hands and try to figure out how exactly you're going to move behind cover, eventually aim, and eventually engage the target. Do you press X, Y, do you use the left thumbstick, do you use the right bumper? What if there was a more intuitive solution, a more clear way of you interacting with your virtual experience? My name is Phil Cotter and I'm with the Stumpworks team. We're a venture that's poised to revolutionize the way that you interact with video games and simultaneously provide returns to neuroprosthetic research. Um, we were uh, developed to solve the problem of um, current neuroprosthetics being too heavy and clumsy. Uh, to really address current amputees issues. Um, Stump, the Stumpworks team was able to uh, develop a small open source board that uh, addresses all of these issues successfully. And um, I'm going to have to refer to my notes here, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, and successfully can translate the electrical signals from your muscles 
into digital signals that can be used to control a video game. So imagine turning your head slightly in reality and having the Master Chief and Halo kind of look in the same direction, or physically shooting a free throw and having it be recreated down to the Twitch. We have a three-phase business model that um, allows us to fully harness the power of open source R&D, allows us to fully engage the over $621 million video game peripheral market, and uh, also provide a return in both technology and funding to other neuroprosthetic ventures. Uh, in phase one, we look to give our fully operational board to universities who currently pay a large amount of money for similar devices. Phase two, we're going to target video game developers. And in phase three, the, our, the video games that have been built around our board will finally be released to the mass market. Um, Stumpworks currently isn't really looking for a, a huge amount of funding. We're targeting loans and grants uh, right now. Um, With uh, the we out there and others in development, do you have concerns that this is just what's coming next for them, or how is this going to kind of beat them to um, launch on this? Our, our device clearly already exists, and you can see somebody playing Guitar Hero with our device successfully right now. So the kind of things that it does, that the Wii doesn't do, is it can, it can uh, signal intensity, so it can detect how intensely you're pressing something, which would allow for something like like an arm wrestling game that could actually tell how hard you were pushing. Um, additionally, it speaks Bluetooth, USB, Wii, um, among others. So right now it's kind of, it, comes, it could go a bunch of different directions. And so by releasing it to video game developers, uh, we, with a polished software developer kit, uh, we look for them to kind of choose what the market needs and through licensing agreements with them, uh, turn profit. Is it something that actually somebody could purchase and then use it with any gaming system that they have? Or is that what you're trying to develop? You could, but plug in in any way? I, I think that um, the video game market has already proven to be really receptive to peripheral driven uh, <coughs> titles. Guitar Hero 3 was the first video game to ever generate over a billion dollars. So what we're looking to do is partner with a video game, uh, refine the technology <coughs> so that it works very, very well with a game initially, and then kind of introduce it to the public that way. Uh, additionally, um, because it's open source, uh, it we'll have a website so that home users can, can develop on their own as well, which kind of comes back to fostering our goal of neuroprosthetic research. 10% um, of our annual revenues will be given at the end to the Open Prosthetics Project, which is uh, a group that's out there right now uh, trying to develop the next generation of prosthetics for amputees, because currently a lot of them are too heavy or clumsy to really be effective and people prefer the hoax and bullies of the 1950s technology that's out there. Describe how this would work for a prosthetic. Well, what it does is, essentially, like I said, it has so many interfaces, um, so ways to output the digital signal. Um, what we're doing here is refining the method by which the, the, the signals can be understood, so the biological signals, and by having a team, or <coughs> the entire world, essentially be able to modify the way that the chip works and reads the signals, um, we'll be able to implement it further down the line. Um, so we have an electromechanical hand. Right. That right. And we're going to kind of keep that out of our personal responsibility, develop more of the hardware or the, the software and the board, and then do our kickbacks to organizations like the Open Prosthetics Project, uh, have them foster more of the, the tangible uh, hand that you're talking what about. What have you invented? We've invented a video game controller that's going to redefine the way that you're able to play video games. It's using there's no new algorithms, no new sensing devices, not, not you just sort of using standard ways of sensing. Uh, it uses myoelectro uh, technology just like... But, but not that you haven't invented that, it's the, it's the game controller that you guys have invented. Correct, and the, the, signal, yeah, the signal processing algorithms are, are ours as well. a business competition. Did you know that in Korea, a student has to spend $300 to participate in Model United Nations? Did you know that despite this high price, high participation fee, thousands of students have participated in UN this year? Why is this the case in Korea? It's because there are so many students who want to come to top colleges <coughs> in the US, and they're, and they're looking desperately for anything that will make them stand out. Same case in China and in Singapore. We see this as an opportunity to benefit both us and you. 
we are going to host business competitions in Korea and Singapore with $200 of particip participation fee and further extended to China. Model UN in Korea is hosted by a relatively unknown private firm, YoungBiz, our potential competitor. However, think of you with its name value hosting of this hosting youth international youth challenge trip. The market is big. There has been double-digit increase of uh, U.S. college applicants from Korea and China. And some schools in Singapore are actually called as the Ivy League machines. From this, Duke benefits as well. More presence in Asia would lead to strengthen its prestige and attract more skilled students. Part of our benefit, part of our profits is going to be used in improving business programs at Duke. We have a strong network. My teammate Roger and I are both graduates from prep schools in Korea and Singapore, and we know, which is well known for sending students to U.S. colleges. We know teachers, and we know students who actually want these programs. We further have other international support, and we know of, we understand the situation better, better than anyone else since we, back in high school, were also desirous of these competitions. For now, we need Duke and Duke Star Challenge support to make this women game happen. Thank you. Is this something that you would do and use and get permission to use in Duke game? Or is it something that you would enable to do? Yeah, something that um, I'm going to suggest you can start a challenge yourself to make get permission to be in the So you, you would like permission to be Yeah, so that's why I'm having a pitch right here to start a challenge. <laughs> <laughs> So there are steps beyond the startup challenge to get the ability yes. to use the new game. Is there, are there start, are there business plan competitions in Korea that this would compete with? Uh, business competitions? Yeah, but they're mostly um, organized by like unknown private firms, mostly private firms. And there are, there's a potential risk like other Ivy Leagues. I mean, Ivy Leagues and other prestigious schools like, tried before to like, open these competitions in like mock trials at Harvard, but they all, all of them, most of them have, like failed because of lack of international like, students' support. And yeah, so we believe that when the like, international students like me and the others like give energy and focus more energy into it, we can make it possible. All right, up next is Leadership Institute for Future Entrepreneurs. So hello, my name is Abhishek Pam, and I'm the CEO of the Leadership Institute for Future Entrepreneurs. So entrepreneurship and financial literacy education are two key factors to social mobility and community development. Yet in our community here, where 20% of the people live under the poverty line, two of 46 public high school or two of uh, 46 uh, public schools offer entrepreneurship education. So enter the Leadership Institute for Future Entrepreneurs. We are committed to promoting community engagement by developing and designing a curriculum on entrepreneurship and financial literacy based on high-level academic text throughout, uh, uh, the Duke, throughout uh, various Duke curriculum. And what we do is we take this high, these high-level uh, documents and we pull it down into hands-on activities that we then go and deliver in these schools. Uh, our, and, and we do so with the input of, uh, of Duke faculty and also we have uh, we have uh, principles in, uh, so our, our curriculum is backed by the North Carolina Council for Economic Education. Uh, right now, we operate in uh, the North Carolina School of Science and Math, and we've been doing so for a semester and a half. Next semester, we're expanding to the Fulton Vocational School, and uh, we've contracted with the Durham Parks and Recreational Services to come up with an after-school curric uh, entrepreneurship curriculum for middle school students. We're also in conversations with two uh, other nonprofits in the area to provide tailored entrepreneurship education to fit their needs. Um, what we need, so we're composed of one, thank you. <laughs> we'll get some of that out of it. Yeah. How do you make money? How do 
we don't make money. So, oh, okay. so it's, <laughs> it's, a, it's a complete nonprofit uh, venture, but we don't make money, but we get something really valuable out of it. Uh, our model is that we, all the members in our organization, 20 members in total, actually get trained in the skills that are necessary for entrepreneurship while we develop this curriculum. You know, and having to walk up in front of a group of people we've never seen, high school students we've never seen, and deliver a curriculum that we're not the experts in, we really get trained in communication. We get trained in the material that we're about to teach. Well, let, let me ask it this way. Yeah. Even if it's a nonprofit, yes. how are you funded then? How are we funded? Well, we were funded by the North, the, the North Carolina Council of Economic Education, okay. uh, but the rest of it is volunteer work. And uh, I mean, our model has proved successful. We have about 20 consistent members, and uh, they are in it, I mean, make no mistake, they're, they are in it for what they get for themselves. And the training that they're getting, they deem it to be valuable enough. For these 20 people? They're all Duke undergrads. And in addition to that, we have uh, five consultants uh, from the Duke Consulting Club here. So it's all undergraduate run. Have you spoken to anybody in uh, the Durham Public Schools? Yes. So we, uh, yeah. So we were uh, we're actually going into the Holton Vocational School, which is uh, Durham Vocational School. Uh, we have plans to go in there next semester <coughs> and deliver this there through working directly with that school. Or yes. With somebody in the school. Uh, through we're, we're, so this semester we had to do a transition to be able to go into that school. We had to get a lot of the uh, we had to take our members into that school to establish a background of relatedness with those kids. I mean we we have to run business there a little bit different from how we do it in the North Carolina School of Science and Math. I, I mean there's there's also a lot of bureaucracy that we had to work through, but uh, we put that work in up front here so that we could do it next semester. I mean, that's already. Are you aware of any other entrepreneurship initiatives for the Durham High School community? For the Durham High School community, well, in one of the schools that we're working with, one of the two schools that do offer entrepreneurship education, uh, they, I mean, they have a class on it. However, uh, it's more academic. Uh, what we do, I mean, one of the activities that we did, we connected with a lot of Durham. Uh, city administrators, and we broke the students up into different teams and had them connect with these city administrators to come up with ideas to address the needs for that particular uh, organization. So the, the waste management people had a problem with uh, some of their employee turnaround, and so we had a group of these high school students working with them. So it's a wonderful idea. We, uh, I know of at least four other things, three of which were involved in. Okay, yeah, that'd be great. Nice job. Thank, Thank you so much. <laughs> All right, next is Smartlet. Hi, my name is Emily Sherman, and I developed Smartlet, a device that's used for cost saving as well as reducing your carbon footprint all at the touch of a button. People everywhere want to join the green, the green movement, but are simply too lazy or don't want to spend the time or money. But there are simple things that you can do. House, many household appliances consume a significant amount of electricity even when they're turned off. This, account, this phantom energy accounts for 10% of the average American family's electric bill and over 5% of the total CO2 emissions uh, produced in the U.S. every year. The Smartlet system solves this problem by conveniently, uh, conveniently by uh, controlling the current that flows to these appliances with the use of a keychain remote. Simply place a Smartlet receiver in between the outlet and the appliance that you'd like to be turned off while you're out of the house or asleep. This can be a TV, a lamp, anything that plugs in. The remote then controls the receiver using a low frequency, um, using a low frequency radio transmitter. It's universal because it requires absolutely no installation um, and can control your entire house, an in individual room, or individual appliances all in the palm of your hand. There are other products on the market that um, provide similar cost saving benefits, but they require costly uh, costly installation. The Smartlet provides all these same benefits at a low cost um, and it's as easy as unlocking your car door. A starter kit of five Smartlet, uh, a starter kit of sm five Smartlet receivers and one Smartlet remote would cost $50. This would uh, pay for itself within five months 
And at this, at this price point, our product cost estimates produce a 60% profit margin. We'd initially target communities that have um, demonstrated environmental consciousness and um, distribute the product through high-end electronic stores, moving toward wider distribution as the product caught on. My team is composed of a um, private contractor as well as a serial <coughs> entrepreneur. So hopefully we can make this a big success in a growing market. Thank you. products on the market, are there products that are specifically plugged into the outlets and used in a similar way or? Well, so, you know, we've already seen one option right. tonight, which is more of an installation based one. Right. That's going to cost, you know, like he said, um, two years to pay that money back. Right. Um, this comes in a kit off the shelf, you know, you can customize it however you want. Um, in terms of other products that plug directly into the wall, there are smart strips, but um, like the other presenter also said, you have to walk around and turn those off manually which creates a huge hassle, things that people don't want to do. And the biggest issue today, especially with Americans, is creating the easiest way to save you money you know, without actually having to do anything and also hopefully help the environment. So with this, the, cus the customer has complete control over the technology. <coughs> they can use it in any way they want, in any size house or in an apartment. So could I walk into a room or, or walk out of a room in my house and have all the outlets controlled and just with one push turn all the electricity off in that room? Correct. As you can see here, it would be on your keychain. So it's small. It looks like kind of like your car key remote. The big button here, control, turns off all four channels in the house, on or off. So if you walk out the door, you just push that button. Everything that's hooked up to a smart lid will shut off. However, that creates an issue if you want to control a single room, or as you walk into a room, you just want to turn on the TV. So here you have set up four different channels, and you, the customer has complete control over this. They just simply set the smart lid receiver to that specific setting and that automatically connects it with the remote on those four buttons. So they really have control if they just want to use it in an apartment, you know, one button for a TV, one button for a lamp, or if you're in a big house, each button can work for an entire room. Uh, absolutely, it's actually really simple technology. It's using a radio transmitter, so same thing that works in your garage door. Um, I guess my question is, is there protectable technology behind this idea? In terms of a patent? Yeah. Not specifically um, to this, like, there's really not anything I could patent because it's all very basic technology. The business model is really focusing on branding. Um, it would definitely be important, like I said, we're working through high-end electronics retailers, so the design is a very important factor here. Um, and the product is simple to produce, so hopefully we can get it to market very quickly and be one of the first products there that does this. The contractor that you referred to, he works in um, uh, electronics and uh, works actually with government outlets, um, so has experience from actually earlier in his career working with smaller electronics, and now is working with bigger systems based. But so I'm really using him as an advisor um, to see, you know, understand the feasibility of this technology, but then also work through finding the proper manufacturer overseas, most likely, and creating um, an effective way to produce this product and keep that profit margin high. Mm -hmm. And you said for $50, a $50 investment, you believe that will be, that will make that? I think you could actually sell it for more, but I'd like to start at $50 as a, for the pilot launch um, to see what we could really get. But they recover that after six months, you were saying? Right? The consumer recovers it after five, five months, right, yeah. $10 a month on average savings. Hi, I'm Kelly Merkwitz, and I feel like I'm always on the go, whether I'm going to a supermarket or driving home for Thanksgiving break, and this got me thinking, how is all this traveling I'm doing impacting the environment? Are there changes I can make to reduce my carbon footprint? Other websites like Google Maps or MapQuest just give me directions. They don't tell me how my travel decisions are impacting the environment. And this is how I got the idea for GetThereGreen.org. GetThereGreen.org allows you to take the environment into consideration when you're making the travel decisions by showing you all the different routes as well as the carbon impacts of all those routes so you can select the one that's most still efficient, helping the environment and your wallet. For example, taking a 60 mile an hour <coughs> highway instead of a 70 mile an hour highway can reduce your carbon emissions as well as save you 48 cents per gallon of gas. Um, 
In addition, getbygreen.org would allow users to explore alternative means to getting to their destination, like public transportation routes uh, or bike paths they never knew existed. We think this is a very viable business venture because people are concerned about global warming and want to do what they can to help. And in this economic recession, people are looking for simple ways to save money. Right now, we are in the very early stages of our uh, company. We are uh, looking at partnering with various environmental organizations um, and doing market research. And we're really looking to broaden our team and bring on people with more computer skills. Uh, so thank you very much for listening to this presentation. And we hope that one day you will make getthergreen.org get there the first stop on your journey. Thank you. Spouse of a Nicholas School graduate. Sure. My wife would be very interested as well. So. Um, how are you going to make money? Advertise on the website. Okay. And also, hoping to partner with environmental organizations that would be interested in this idea. And, and you see the, the category of advertisers being uh, other environmental minded mm -hmm. products or things exactly. like that. Yeah. Other than choosing a 60 mile an hour our highway uh, instead of a 70 mile per hour highway. Um, what, what other instances are there where the most green is not the shortest route? Well, first of all, I think that the algorithms for this could be rather complicated because most people know that you know, your highway miles versus your city miles an hour are going to be different. And it's also going to vary based on your kind of car you're driving. So hopefully the, the website would also allow you to personalize it to your car, the kind of miles per gallon that your car gets. Also, in terms of uh, so city versus highway, um, hills, I'm not sure how <laughs> how feasible that would be to incorporating that, but that would be interesting because hills obviously use more gas. And even if you couldn't, even if the routes were comparable in terms of how fuel efficient they were, it would also be useful to know the carbon impact because I feel like people knew how they were impacting the environment and also framing it in an easy to understand way, your CO2 emissions, that people may, you know, take less trips to the grocery store or plan their routes in a more fuel efficient manner. They could put that into in a quantifiable terms of their environment. Would you ever people just tell people just don't go on the trip? Just call your grandmother, don't visit her. <laughs> That's a good excuse. <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't think about that, but um <laughs> What's, what are you majoring in? Um I'm not sure, I'm still a sophomore, I'm thinking that. Oh, okay. So you can use that to Yes, hopefully. <laughs> So why, why you have a number of ideas that seem to be good ideas? I'm, I'm not if, if I'm trying to figure out how to get to somewhere in New Jersey. Not defend the word, but uh, uh, <coughs> the bike path stuff would not necessarily be interesting to me at that point. Um, but if I'm thinking about uh, you know bike rides and stuff, why 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 this bucket of ideas? in one place get their green dot org as opposed to, you know, either a broader environmental focus or a narrower <coughs> focus on just this? Well, we think that people who are environmentally minded want to have it in all in one place. And we have the different options that would be available to you tailored to your destination. So if you're, you know, planning a cross country car ride, we're not gonna suggest a flight route. <laughs> um, <laughs> you're off the hook. So we think just having all these environments because these is, it's all targeted towards environmental friendliness, and I think having it all in one place makes it easier. Yeah. Good job. Oh, great. Very Thank good. You. The next is twenty-one watt. Good evening, everyone. Thanks a lot for coming here tonight. My name is Yi, and uh, this is why I'm going to present this twenty-one watt. So nowadays, mainstream nationwide scholarly journals are focusing on publishing research articles from graduate students or faculty members. However, there are many undergraduate students who are conducting independent research in labs, but they got fewer chances to publish their works. Also, unlike professional scientists, undergraduate researchers uh, get little access to their peers' works in other institutions, and they got fewer chances to communicate with each other. 
Although their works are of lower scientific values, they do deserve a chance to have their work recognized. And that's the reason we founded Plumbot. <coughs> we want to build a platform for undergraduate researchers to have their work recognized to the public and to communicate with each other, especially with other students in other, in other institutions. Also, okay, so what we believe is that we are not just trying to publish uh, research articles for undergrad students, but we are encouraging them to pursue science and engineer as their careers and to uncover the, nat <coughs> uncover the mystery of na nature and to make innovations contributing to a better world in the future. So that we call, that's why we call it talking about what? Those young people, those young scientists and engineers are the power for the 21st century. Thank you. What's your major? Oh, I'm so far too, so I'm thinking about math and physics. <coughs> and are, are, do you have a field of research that you are thinking of pursuing that you think you'd like to publish it before you graduate? Yes, actually I was conducting like summer research at Duke University last summer. So I was one of the, uh, I think, summer dean's research fellowship program. And I was doing research in the physics lab, and I really have fun. And I think it would be a better, it would be a good idea for me to have my experience published and to have others know. And there are such opportunities, and being an uh, undergrad research can be really fun. So like, I'm attracting other students to do research in the summer, too. So I think it's a good chance to form such a community for us to come to make this challenge. And how would you, uh, how would this make money? What would you, what would your revenue source be? Okay, so the codes for the, this journal, okay. So the thing is that the Duke University Library, we're contacting with them, and they have a pilot project with some, like, uh, I think, uh, public knowledge project in Canada, and that's a project that Duke University Library is doing now. And this is a uh, free online resources and open resources thing. So basically what we are based on is like digital version mm -hmm. instead of like print version. So we don't need money to print things. And this whole software is free. And we are communicating with the physics department to give us free like free server on the basis of server. So basically there's no cost. And how can we make money? So first step is that we are thinking about uh, communicating with like universities graduate admission offices so we can help them to publish uh, like advertisement to recruit new students. And actually we just got our first fund from the University Physics Department. It's not that much, but $500, $500 per year. I think it's good enough. At least can cover the first year. <laughs> yeah, and in the future, we're thinking about talking to IBM or Google, such, such companies who has like R&D department, who want to recruit some like students who have the research background as their young research scientists. So we can have them help them to make advertisement to attract young I people. Would, I would definitely recommend go, you know, trying to find a company like that that <coughs> owns, not owns, but owns the advertising on the site. You know what I mean? So that if it's Google, if it's Microsoft, if it's whoever it is, that they become the sponsor of the site. But this online advertising for this specific site, probably by itself, if you were selling to a bunch of different companies, wouldn't be as strong. Whereas if you could get, it sounds like a low cost organization to run that if you could have one big sponsor that really kind of you know owned the advertising in that space I think that would be an interesting way to go. So, Thank you. so do you so you would like to publish, would you like to read the work that undergraduates are doing at the University of Chicago or Yale or University of Texas? Yes I'd love to. One reason for that is that I think some of at least some of the students who's now doing research as as undergrad students want to go to graduate school later, and they really want to know. For example, for me, that I'm doing I was doing research in a lab, but I was not doing such really independent research, but I was helping one of the professors. So I'd love to know what kind of opportunities they offer at their at other graduate schools, and I want to know the research interests of other professors in other schools. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Is Good evening. I'm here speaking on behalf of Catch a Ride or Car. Now, we here at Duke have a problem, and that is transportation. It's very difficult for students to get off campus. Our solution a student run carpool system. The idea goes like this Suppose you're a Duke student and you're heading off campus. You have four extra seats in your car. Now, using our website, that student can post that information 
where another student can find it and buy a seat. We think this system will be advantageous to both drivers and passengers. The drivers can uh, get some of their expenses back, i.e. in the form of gas money, and passengers can get a good form of transportation. Not only is this environmentally friendly, but it can also help foster community among Duke students. Now we are currently in talks with the DSG, uh, trying to get a system in, trying to get the system in place. We know that they have this, uh, have interest in establishing a system like this. Some of our goals that we would like to reach is first designing the system and building the website. Secondly, we would reach out to student organizations and the Greek system to establish our initial user base, who can provide both drivers and passengers. And uh, lastly, we want to do some market research into regulating prices to make sure there's no uh, there's no over competition and price gouging. At this current stage, we're, we're in looking for an investment of about five thousand dollars to uh, to afford development costs of the website, hiring programmers, doing more in-depth market research to evaluate pricing models, and lastly, to investigate the issue of liability. Thank you. Being a parent, nice job, by the way, very interesting idea. Being a parent, my first thought was about the liability issue. Um, do you know anything about that? Do you have any reason to think that, um, that Duke would not be liable in the case of an accident that uh, where someone was injured and they've been connected to the driver through the system? Honestly, we haven't done that much research into the liability issue. But my primarily, uh, my first thought would be that anyone using the system would have to agree to take on at least some risk in the form of this. But it, it, bear, it does bear more investigation. Or I, guess I don't have any other experience. issues. I mean, beyond, you know, you get in the car with somebody and they decide that they were actually going to go somewhere else. You know, um, well, I just didn't. The, other, uh, the, the model that we're uh, focusing on is the eBay model, yeah. which where users can rate their experience. Okay. Like, so you can rate on like somebody did your driver positive. arrive on time, right. did you go where you say, stuff like that. Just think, yeah, it's hard for me. <laughs> I mean, no. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Now, now you um, is there a message board where you can post? Hey, I'm driving to DC this weekend and have an empty uh, spot. Do you, is there something like that? Here? I believe um, I actually investigated <coughs> last year. There is like a very preliminary ride board that the DSG hosted last year sometime. But actually, when I investigated it for, for my various trips on spring break, um, I could not find one. They, uh, and I actually went to the DSG and they told me that it, they used to run one, but it's no longer, it's completely falling apart. Because everybody in Duke has their own car or because uh, of the money? I'm not, uh, they didn't actually give me an explanation, but I do know just as, um, as, um, as a personal survey around my friends, we do not have cars. Can so. <laughs> <laughs> somebody please give this guy a ride? <laughs> so that would be worth knowing because that would be. Uh, that existed when I was in college. Um, you know, so obviously the liability issue is somehow been circumvented for a ride board. I think it's sort of piggyback on that. Anyway. You might also know, try to figure out why that doesn't exist. Anymore. Obviously, that's not for hey, I'm going on the phone with a check. You know, right. You know, this was more for significant rides. So, how many of your friends would use this service? Off the top of my head, I know at least. A couple of my friends, like maybe about three or four, have cars, and maybe about 15 do not. So you can do a survey right here. How many of you would use this to catch a ride? How many of you that, uh, if you want to admit that you have a car, would offer up space in your car if you were going somewhere? Well, as a note, you would, you would be paid. <laughs> you, got you were clear enough. I understood that. So, yeah, there's a, there's a small need here. Thank you. 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 Hi, next is Food For You. Hi, I'm Kelly Waldman and I'm the co-founder of Food For You. I'm sure everyone in here at some point has called a restaurant to place a takeout order and have experienced something that went wrong in the order. Well, Food For You is the solution for this. 
Food for You is an interactive online website that will feature all of Duke's Merchants for Points vendors' menus online, where you can go online, check their menus, order what you want, say how you want it done, and if you have any food allergies, to list it. Now, what makes this different from other online ordering sources is that for Duke students, you'll be able to use your Duke card, which is a really big plus because right now, you can't do that. Another thing is we're going to have a favorites profile where you can order your favorite food from your favorite restaurant with just one click. Additionally, we're going to have a search feature where you can search for a meal, say like spaghetti, and get a listing of every single restaurant that's currently making that. And you can use that to pick um, where you want it from. Now, for making our profits, Food for You is probably, or sorry, is going to have a subscription plan for the restaurants where they will get charged like a monthly fee and also from ads on the website. Um, right now, my team consists of myself and Aaron Pintel, and we're the two co founders. And we're currently undergrads in Pratt's, and we have one other additional team member for program that does, helps us with programming. And so what we're looking for right now is another programmer to help us get the website running. And um, so right now, currently we're in the research and development phase where we're still talking to people at Duke and still talking to restaurants to see how exactly this would work. And we also have a, um, a prototype of the website. So what we're looking for in the next couple of months to have a working website for people to use and also um, an initial investment of about $2,000 for anticipated server fees. Thanks. So right now, um, if you order food anywhere else online, there's for most places you can't use your food points. Is what you're saying. Right. A couple of restaurants do like Sonali's. They do have an online ordering system yeah. where you can place your order online, but there's no place for a gift card. And they you place your order online, and you call them like a second later and be like, "Oh, I just placed a food order online, but I want to use my gift card to pay." They get really, really annoyed because it messes like with their whole system. Yeah. So we just you get mad and you're like, yeah. forget it. Will this apply to Jimmy John? Because I like it. <laughs> We're working right now on getting all of the restaurants on merchants for points because they already have a gift card. Yeah. If you place your number like online, it's essentially the same as calling it in, only there's a lot less confusion and people can just read it and it's not hearing it. So hopefully if you get all of those restaurants and it's successful, we're looking at either like expanding it to other restaurants and possibly Whole Foods. Have you thought about having a small charge for the uh, customer as well? You know, 10 cents, 25 cents? Um, we have thought about that, but um, that's more for like when, I, when we actually work with you to see how they would do that. Yeah, but we're taking that into consideration. So, do you, so your, your thesis is the mistakes are made because the person at the end of the end of the phone and realize your restaurant doesn't appear that you want pepperoni and hot and sausage and pizza. There's that, and also if you're having like a big group of people together or just like studying with a couple other people, if you call and you're like, okay, well I want this and this goes on this due card, but then what I just ordered goes on this due card, there's just like a lot of confusion and they get annoyed. So we're thinking if you just have it, like, if you just have it on the website and it's in black and white, it's going to be a lot less confusing and a lot more efficient. Yeah. 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 I, I, you could ask, could everybody use this service? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's good. It's a stupid idea. <laughs> no, I mean, I think it makes it, it, enormous sense. Um, I'm trying to think of if there would be other obstacles um, in doing this, but I mean, obviously, people are ordering off campus all the time, so um, it's a better hurry. Yeah, well, so have you, I mean, you're not the first person to think about having a website connected to restaurants for ordering food. And in fact, that exists in many, many cities, doesn't exist here. But you're, what you're doing uniquely is the, uh, the Duke card connection to it. Yeah, it would be the Duke card, and then what I said about like the favorite, so say you always order like a specific sandwich from Jimmy John's, if you can just click it, then that makes it a lot easier, just like five seconds, and also a search feature where if you like really, really want like salmon or something, you can search and be like, and you get all these restaurants, and you can, oh, like I want to prepare it this way. Does, does that not exist in the services in New York and Chicago? Um, 
I don't know that for university departments. No, not, not for the department. Yeah. I, yeah. I haven't really seen that much of it. It does, but I think the card point is a huge, right. huge part of it. But it's worth looking that up in case you can steal some of their ideas. Yeah. <laughs> Honestly, <laughs> that's the best way. You know, somebody doing something that works, I would highly recommend that. Because in New York and a couple of other cities, that's better. Thank you. Thank you. Next, uh, I think it's Yo Show. <laughs> Wanted to hear this. <laughs> He's a no-show. Yeah. <laughs> really? wow. I just couldn't wait. Like I thought the whole talk was going to be delivered in the uh, show. <laughs> 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 Second sound bites, it becomes increasingly difficult for the average person to be aware of less prominent social injustices. When hidden from national prominence and consciousness, it becomes difficult for a nonprofit to gain two valuable resources, funds and volunteers. Grassley solves this problem. Sorry, Grassley solves this problem by facilitating social dialogue for these lesser known causes through the use of user-generated graphic t-shirts. For example, our education and Durham campaign, we raised $1,000 and 10 buyers ultimately became established with the partnering nonprofit. The market for submission based t shirts has grown into a multi million dollar industry with a large community of active designers. The user generated model also lowers uh, production costs and enables us to donate over 60% of our profit. As a result, there is a viable market and community for these types of um, t shirts. However, there is no venture that has yet incorporated social activism into their mission. Grassley is backed by a group of 20 committed students from both Duke and UNC, and we have already incorporated in the state of North Carolina, and, have, and they're currently looking to file for 501c3. Grassley has also <coughs> been already awarded three grants that total in excess of $5,000, and has attracted a generous donor to pledge an additional $10,000. For next semester, we've already decided to have two more campaigns for our issues, and develop a new website. Our aim is to establish an overarching community that will, that will connect both community uh, designers and socially aware people. Thus, we are looking forward to establishing our presence on the internet and at Duke and UNC. Thank you. You talked about social justice. Are you saying that, um, I mean, would there be Nonprofits of all different kinds of fields that could actually yes. submit t shirts, and you guys would vet that, but you guys would say this doesn't apply, or a nonprofit that says, you know, so basically, UNC would not be qualified. And that. So basically, um, we're allowing people to submit ideas for issues, so things that they're close to them. Um, for example, um, my sister is from in Albania, and so they submitted the idea about uh, youth activism in Albania, and so we found a nonprofit working with that specific cause called NIAF. Basically, establish a partnership. Now we had an open design competition that allowed users from both Duke and UNC and actually anywhere around the world submit designs for the shirt. And ended up in, actually, the, uh, the winning design ended up being from an Albania. So um, then we uh, make the shirt and sell it, and 60% uh, of over 60% of the profit is then donated to the organization. And our aim is also to get people really interested in the cause and then be able to uh, donate more of their time and uh, effort for those. There's, there's no question the online t-shirt business is huge. It, it's actually strange to become the most profitable business, part of our business. So, um, yeah, it's very So, I mean, to pick up on, on Will's question, what what level of editorial control do you want to retain? What kind of messages are acceptable and not acceptable? How will you go to the lines? Definitely. Um, right now, I have a uh, team of six design members who <coughs> will actually look at the uh, screen designs and make sure that there are acceptable submissions. Um, we definitely will not, we will post all submissions on our site, but if they are unacceptable, they will go through the screening process and obviously not be shown. Um, we always will work with the artist if there are, if there is a slight modification to the design so that it can be better portrayed on the t-shirt, we will let the artist know and make sure that they are fine with that change. Well, what about not so much the design side as mm -hmm. the cause? Like, I mean, okay. actually the better example I could think of, let's take the abortion issue. Yes. 
people are strong on both sides. What do you do about that? Or is that one you just don't allow? Or how do you make that decision? Um, well, for the abortion issues, it's it's a little different since we're looking towards more of social justice in the sense of... Um, Whose definition of social justice? Yeah, I, okay. guess I see. Social, so. Um, so we accept all submissions, and we do end up choosing which issue is being portrayed. And if it is really controversial, um, it may not be in our best interest as a company to portray it, um, because we do not want negative feedback. However, that is something we can look into. We will look into probably. But, but I guess the, mm -hmm. the, the idea of social justice yeah. is idea, but it's not uncontroversial by itself. I agree completely. So. Um, and it's, it's a difficult process, and right now there are, um, I guess, less controversial venues that we can go with, like looking into global health and um, you know, animal prevention, um, stuff like that. So you guys would choose which ones you know, made the cut and which issues you were talking about? Yeah, eventually you do want to go to um, a system where you can vote online, um, and yeah. so that way we can see which cause has the most interest. Thank you, John. All right, our last bit of the night, Kibitz. Are you familiar with, are you familiar with Bradless? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. So just being here in this room, I think we can all agree that undergraduates are just like, like a great group of people to come up with amazing and innovative ideas. You know, we know this from the startups they come up with, the amazing events on campus they come up with, or just from daily conversation with, with each other. But so what? When a tree falls in the forest and the ones that are here, it doesn't make a sound. <laughs> Every year, people, undergraduates, come up with great idea. They do everything right in getting their company going, but the thing is, no one knows about it. Same thing on campus. People come up with great ideas on events, they have planned tons of events, very well planned, but students are like, what is that? What was that on Thursday? So, our vision, Kibitz, a collegiate marketing consulting group. Basically, our members are agents from areas of all expertise, prominently DIDA, the Duke Innovate Design Agency. We can come with you and come together and make a logo, a website, or craft your entire marketing campaign for a fraction of the cost you pay right now. Currently, if you go out and find a designer, you'll end up paying over $1,000 for a logo and another $1,000 for a website. We can do that for much less. And what makes us experts is we're currently researching and collecting marketing data on what works on the college campus. We'll know what ads, what forms of creative advertising reaches the college community. And with that, we'll use that information and develop your idea so that you can be successful. We want to take this idea first at Duke University, collect data here, make it, you know, create our kind of image. But later on, we're going to take, take this company and spread to other college campuses and within two or three years. So what do we need? Obviously, we need a basic startup cost for a website, basic advertising. But most of all, we need you as clients. Because if we make our idea happen, we work for you to make your idea the next big thing. Thank you. <laughs> Marketing club, it's basically all kinds of students on campus with multiple, different expertise. Uh -huh. So you're you're targeting anybody on campus that has a business idea or an organization idea or something, and then they want to start getting the word out. Exactly about that. Yeah. And do you have any clients yet, or do you need to have your startup uh, website in place before you can get clients? Well, obviously we're going to have to find funding for the web hosting to get startup up, get our word out there. But we've already started talking to multiple people about getting their idea out there. It could be a student um, having their personal idea, maybe like, hmm, I want to market this. Or working with student organizations. Our current members, since they're already working with DIDA, they've already started working with multiple organizations about you know, crafting a good marketing plan. Um, many of the, the, the startups in this competition actually come to DIDA and work with our designers on making their logo and things like that. Um, but just uh, overall, we're, we've already been starting getting, getting that experience, and we're hoping to make this a more prominent thing on campus. How much would you charge? Um, so, well, look, the competitive <coughs> price right now is about $1,000 for a logo. Um, it's gonna, the price is going to be split between, obviously, something on campus, uh, as a nonprofit, and a, a for-profit venture. 
Um, for a profit venture, well, it will obviously be higher, maybe around the range of like 200 for a website, which is still much less than like, like uh, the current cost. Um, but then for something on campus, well, there's like uh, the student activities fund, their own funds can fund stuff, but it would be much lower. Um, but so it will be scaled based on that. So what's the green blob at the left of kids? The green blob right there is just kind of like, it's kind of like Ideas generating right here. It's kind of like an abstract kind of notion. It's actually yellow. Uh, yellow. It's kind of like yellow. Okay, from this angle, it's great. That one. So, um, and and you guys designed that? Yeah, that was just like a. It's, it's just it's a temporary. Um, this is one of our drafts. It's kind of new, so yeah, it's actually pretty interesting. Cook pivots. Um, it's, if you take out the B, it actually stands for unwanted middle sum advice. It's kind of ironic. Kind of like that. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's been interesting seeing how much Dida has, you know, really exploded and just kind of you know, from nothing to so many organizations and it sounds like even you know departments around campus would like to be taking advantage of, the, of what's going on there. So there definitely seems to be interest in this. I guess it's just a matter of figuring out whether that revenue model can work for you guys as a right. business. Do you see it being a, a non-profit or something that you want as a... Uh, I think in the long run, it will be for-profit. Um, largely, it would depend on the clients. Obviously, if uh, under our <coughs> currently planned uh, pricing model, if they're all like student groups and undergraduate groups, then yeah. we can't really make much for profit. But like it depends a lot on the clients. Sure. So they're, they're certainly there. Thank you. Thank you. I have some round of applause for everybody pitch tonight. Hey guys. Uh, so first off, just um, I just want to congratulate everybody tonight. Um, all the pitches were fantastic. Uh, I was chatting with the judges uh, just during the break, and they were like, "Man, like every one of these ideas could be like a real company." Um, so whether or not uh, you win tonight, or whether or not you advance to the finals, um, I just want to congratulate everyone. So just a quick round of applause for everybody here. Uh, and the other thing I want to say is, um, so uh, it, it's you know it, it, it's a difficult it's, doing an elevator pitch, two minute elevator pitch in front of a room of you know 50 people and on camera and you got a microphone and you got two judges out here and you got a projector behind you. That is a completely artificial uh, experience, right? You're never going to be in an elevator with all of these things going, having an investor there. Um, so we realize that, and we also realize that, that that's a stressful experience. So. Um, it's over now. Okay. You know, exhale. It was a, I'm sure it was a good learning experience. But part of the reason that we do it, um, and part of the reason I want to talk about the executive summary competition that's coming up next, is um, it's, a, it's a really interesting exercise in distilling your idea into something that anybody that you sort of randomly meet, whether it could be a potential partner or a potential investor, distilling it down to something that they can really uh, uh, kind of understand quickly. Right? So, um, yeah, I, I worked at a bunch of startups, and the one thing I found with, with entrepreneurs is um, they have a lot of ideas, and uh, they can never stop talking about those ideas. Right? They can go on for for uh, you know hours talking about it, um, but you don't have hours with, with an investor um, or, or with a potential partner. And so I think you know this learning how to distill your idea down to something that's two minutes long, or learning how to visually distill it down. I mean, like a lot of folks didn't necessarily use the slide, you're not going to have a slide uh, in an elevator if you just randomly meet somebody. But learning how to visually uh, and verbally distill your ideas down to something um, uh, very brief, I, th I think is a good exercise. And on that topic, that's the next competition that we have, is the executive summary competition. So as you guys know, there's three competitions that are part of uh, the Duke Startup Challenge. First is this competition, the elevator pitch. Next one is the executive summary. And the finals one is uh, it's kind of like the in finals investor pitch. So, what do you do with the executive summary? So again, you have all these ideas, uh, you, know, you guys are, are gonna be developing them over the next couple uh, weeks and months, uh, but what we want you to do is summarize that down to five pages, something that you could hand an investor, um, and they, could, they can make it a decision, you know, do I wanna have a, uh, you know, an hour long conversation? So, the point of this was, okay, uh, you have two minutes in an elevator with somebody, um, they're gonna be in town next week, they only have an hour to spend, um, how, do I, how do I get their time next week when they're going back in town? This is, okay, I have an idea and I want to sit down with an investor in their office, like a venture capital or something like that, for an hour, okay? 
uh, frankly, you actually won't have an hour in the finals. So you'll have 10 minutes to give your, your pitch. But you, know, you, you, um, you want to qualify to, to, to get into that uh, office. That's what this competition is all about. So it's a five-page executive summary that you write up for your business. Uh, anybody can, can compete. So whether you competed in, in the elevator pitch competition or not, you're, uh, you're, you're, you're OK to, to participate. Uh, there, there will be prizes price associated with this. But the big thing is that this will help you qualify to advance to the uh, finals event in April, where we're giving away um, over $25,000. So um, oh, and also, uh, there's a free copies of Business Plan Pro for, for anybody that, that competes. So, uh, you know, it's a uh, it's it's really the it's the next step in this process, right? You guys have <coughs> sort of distilled your idea down to two minutes. Now you can expand it to five pages, and then in the final event, you'll have to write a full blown business plan and uh, do a ten minute uh, investor presentation. So, over the course of the year, you know, your ideas are going to be expanding. You can flesh them out more and. Uh, um, yeah, and I encourage everybody to, uh, to participate in this. Any questions on, actually, the executive summary competition? So deadline is, uh, we're, it was originally going to be January 12th. We're actually going to push it back. So expect sometime in late January, we're going to announce the exact time frame. But, uh, but I'd uh, get started working on it, because uh, you, you'll have a busy uh, winter break. Pardon <laughs> mind otherwise. <laughs> and at this point, Judge is magically walking the door. <laughs> Ready to go. Thank you. Thank you. So there's obviously, uh, <laughs> oh my there's many other very valuable uh, entrepreneurship <laughs> activities that I'd encourage you all to get involved in. So let me pitch a couple of those. So uh, one of those is the uh, Duke Entrepreneurship Education Series. How many folks have, have been to one of those? OK, so not, not everybody in the room. So uh, I'll, I'll actually do a little pitch for that. So, um, so what we do is, uh, in addition to kind of having this competition, um, uh, there is a weekly uh, speaker series uh, that uh, where we bring in either entrepreneurs or investors or, uh, or folks that, that, that know a lot about um, starting companies. Uh, and uh, they, they basically, you know, uh, talk about uh, different topics, everything ranging from uh, you know, how to give a good elevator pitch all the way to how to write a good business plan. So, for instance, uh, coming up in, uh, I want to say it's like January, there will be a business plan 101 talk. Uh, and the series of talks that happen in the Duke Entrepreneurship Education Series kind of mimic the, uh, the Duke Startup Challenge. So, as you guys are working on your, uh, your executive summaries uh, or your business plans, There'll be uh, kind of educational content that, that will help you support uh, you guys developing those things. Um, and all of the previous speakers that we've had, um, all of the slides and the videos from all of those talks are available online. If you go to www.dukes.com, uh, -E um, all of that stuff is available, from, both from this year and last year. So it's, a, it's been a, a speaker series that's been going for two years. So that's one thing I'll pitch. <laughs> every single week. Um, another thing I can pitch <laughs> is, uh, I wish Justin was in here, but the, the Duke Entrepreneur. How many people are uh, a member of the Duke Entrepreneur? Okay, so actually, just kind of handful. It's interesting. So, um, so the Duke Entrepreneur is a undergraduate uh, club focused on entrepreneurship, um, and they have a, a range of uh, Activities that you can get involved in, whether it's like the Cairo Society or it's uh, the Duke Entrepreneurship Leader uh, Leadership Venture. Okay. Um, but uh, again, like their their focus is on uh, uh, supporting undergraduates um, uh, through their on entrepreneurship uh, experience here at Duke. So I think we may have a decision. Yeah. All right. Perfect. Yeah. All right. Thanks, everybody. Oh, that's right. Do you remember, we'd like to ask the judges if they could just give some overall picture. Is that it? We were laughing about this, and it was frustrating at the same time because we didn't feel like there was a bad idea in here. So I definitely would encourage all of you to continue pursuing. I mean, there was a nice mix of the kind of 
nonprofit, you know, local worthy cause to the, you know, ideas that you know you're shooting for the stars of a you know much much larger business. But we felt like all of them were worthy of pursuing. So congratulations on them. Uh, it was not fun trying to to uh, to pick the winners. But again, I would encourage you uh, what we talked about before to. Continue your conversations with as many people as you can to try to refine your idea as good as the idea may be. It can get better through talking to others and looking for like-minded organizations, like-minded companies, and actually talking to them if possible. If you don't, if you wouldn't necessarily look at them as a huge competitor, sometimes businesses that you might think of as competitors could actually be hugely helpful to you. So I would I would consider that as well. Um, and to you know get started now. I mean, it's one of those things as you guys know when you're bit by that entrepreneurial bug, you're thinking about it all the time. So um, that's that's actually a good sign that that's happening to you. Trying to think, I need to say something that Will didn't say. <laughs> and what I also wanted to say. <laughs> so I, I do have to. So I have been um, uh, involved in, in listening to the undergraduate pictures now, I think, for four years, as long as I was back at Duke. Um, it's unbelievable how much, just how much progress we've made. And this, so I have to just keep what Will said, there was not any bad idea in the mix. First time I would ever say that. Uh, maybe they're all in the other room. <laughs> they actually arranged. <laughs> so thank you very much. I mean, it's so just so much fun just to listen to your ideas. So terrific. Um, it is um, more than ever, uh, and, and I don't know how many of you know Howie. I'm going to mention Howie again, but I hate the competition aspect of the business plan competition because it's as though you know, well, they didn't like my idea or something wrong. That is not true. And there are several ideas here uh, that um, if, if you're actually looking for money, I would consider investing in it. And, um, and they are not necessarily the ones that are in the, our top list. Um, but I would, I, I would tell you, and I echo what uh, Will said, um, these ideas are all worth pursuing. You should try to, you should try to make them happen. And uh, you should try to force us to give you the resources and the help you need to, uh, to make the ideas real. And in particular, which is why I mentioned Howie before, we should consider some of these ideas. You know, we have a program over at Fuqua where we try to you know, get the business school students, who are not always as entrepreneurial as you are, uh, involved in this uh, process. They have the advantage that they've worked for a while and they've got some business background. With some of the nuts and bolts. But we should seriously think of taking some of these ideas and help you team up with some business school students to see if we can make real business with those things. Because there are some, you know, I mean, in some cases, um, amazing idea. It may turn out that the technology doesn't work. You, know, it's, you don't know until you try. In some cases, technology might work, but you know, we didn't quite understand the market. And in some cases, hey, you know, the match works and, and you have something great. So uh, really, just uh, don't, do not be discouraged by anything that happened to the, tonight. I think the presentations were all great and the ideas were all worth pursuing. So thanks again. Hey, let's thank the judges. <laughs> and that, and I think this works if you have great pitches as well as great judges. So thanks a lot for your, your feedback. You guys want to find out the winner? Yes, please. Yeah. No? You want to uh, just need pitch any more programs? <laughs> All right. So we'll start with the audience choice winner. And the winner is... Carbon. See how the audience voted. So you are a clear winner. Congratulations.
Cumbridge did well as well. Let's, uh, so first, we voted Google number one. <laughs> <laughs> one last, yeah, one last reminder: the finals event, so the best of the best, are going on Friday. At uh, the actual pitch starts at seven o'clock. Um, there's a reception starting at five thirty. With some beverages and food. It's at the People's School of Business. So come, you will get to vote there as well. So if you want to make sure an undergrad wins the whole thing, make sure you show up. And everybody who participate, everybody who participate today, we have a free T-shirt that we'll give to you on Friday. So come and uh, find out who wins the whole thing. And also here, stick around and say hello after this because I mean there are plenty of you that didn't win, but I'd be a love to speak to. So. All right, let's find out who the judges pick to make it uh, to the final event. And there is. You can tell the uh, pleasure that there are only two parents in the room. Yeah. <laughs>